Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. You know, Brexit, Grexitus, everyone is threatening to leave their partners. I'd never leave Stacey, though. <laughs> Chaos and misery will ensue, of course. One said partner leaves the other. All these threats are just bargaining chips to extract compromise. The Greek government could have, of course, chosen to march outside the ECB or outside Merkel's office waving a placard, be nice to me, please. Instead, they threatened the Grexit and Armageddon. You'll be sorry when we're gone. This is how you negotiate, right? Yes, of course, and you know. Yeah. I like this new phrase, Grexitus. Grexit, I'm Spartacus. No, that's another movie. That's another one, oh, exactly. Right. Well, so, you know, uh, the UK is threatening Brexit in order to get, you know, increase their negotiating power against the EU in terms of uh, changing some of the various regulations. And, in, and Greece has threatened Grexit as well. Each side, of course, was using Grexit as a threat. But I've been looking at activism around the world and noticed who's successful and who's not. One big success this week has been Taylor Swift. Headline reads, Apple Music to pay royalties during free trial. We hear you, Taylor Swift. So Apple will pay royalties to music labels and publishers during the three-month free trial of the Apple Music streaming service the company has confirmed after protests from independent labels and musician Taylor Swift. So Taylor Swift uh, published a blog post, and within hours, uh, Apple capitulated because she had threatened to take her album off Apple Music because uh, they were launching this service for three months for free, and therefore they said they weren't going to pay any of the labels. She threatened to remove, to boycott the service, and they capitulated. Well, because she had a specific goal, and she mobilized to achieve that goal. Now, what's the problem with end austerity now? What was the problem with Occupy Wall Street? They had no goal, and they just go after something vague, like, we want, we want fairness. Now, that's never going to work. Not only that, but these groups like End Austerity Now are financially illiterate. And so, to the people who make up these groups, like that Greens woman, Ben, you know, here's a placard from this, after this weekend, where he had the End Austerity Now protest. And it shows David Cameron, quote, I doubled the national debt from $900 billion to $1.4 trillion. But my mates in the Tory press won't tell you that. Look, I mean, two times 900 is not 1.4. It's, you know, it's 1.8, right? I mean, the only way this would make sense is if they said, I doubled the national debt from 700 billion to 1.4 trillion, which is in fact the truth. That's what he did. But some lunatic over there, because they're financially illiterate, because they can't add two plus two, because they, they, have, they don't think that you need to know anything in what you're talking about about economics to succeed in your protest. Some lunatic allowed this placard to be uh, circulated. And of course, you look like a complete idiot. If you can't even add, you know, basic numbers, who's going to take you seriously? Of course, Russell Brand was at that protest you mentioned. And Russell Brand was, um, came out with the book Revolution, but he had some really great successes. And what were those successes? Well, they, he threatened to get the whole population to withhold their vote. And he backed down, though. Like, he capitulated and he said, oh, actually, go out and vote. I back Ed Miliband. And what that did, however, is, you know, if we had an election here, and imagine that only 5% of the population vote, or 10%, had he convinced everybody, and had, every, and had he not backed down, and nobody votes, that therefore makes the, your government illegitimate. But instead, David Cameron, can, he keeps on claiming a mandate. The voters came out, they gave us a mandate, and therefore, uh, Russell Brand backed down, he said, vote for Ed Miliband, and that's in the headlines about that anti-austerity march. Protesters throw insults at Russell Brand at anti-austerity march. Off back to Miliband. Not everyone, they say, was pleased to see Mr. Brand participate. While he famously said that he was against voting, he interviewed former Labour leader Ed Miliband before the May election and came out in support of the party while telling people to vote Green and Brighton. Such a U-turn was not welcomed by a small group of people who hurled abuse at Mr. Brand as he awaited his appearance on stage. One person shouted, sell us a book on revolution and then tell us to vote Labour? You're a turncoat. Like I'm saying, you can't 
base your campaign or your activism or your revolution on vagueness. You can't just go in there and saying, spread love. We want fairness. You need some specific goal and then try to achieve that goal. Now, on Russell Brand's book, Revolution, on the paperback version on page 228, it says, and I quote, I want to kill a corporation. And I know for a fact that I gave him the recipe to nonviolently kill a corporation with the boycott, true boycott hedge fund. Mm. Well, and then this was, yeah. uh, you know, it worked its way up the, 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 the chain of command over there at the uh, media control center and essentially was shot down because it, the goal is not to succeed. The goal is to just make everyone feel good. But of course, if, you're, if the goal is to feel good, we don't need a revolution. Whereas Taylor Swift, she is an activist. She had a specific goal. She's fighting uh, the copyright lobby and Apple, Apple computer. And she lobbied and had a goal and achieved that goal. And, and she should be commended, and she is doing the right thing. Well, what she did is target the earnings of Apple. So a corporation succeeds on its earnings. The price of the share price is based on its earnings. And you, you could target a corporation by withholding, by boycotting, by removing their content to sell or with withholding your purchase. Uh, by the way, the uh, photos from the protests were uh, with... Russell Brand holding his iPhone, as many people pointed out. So she was willing to suffer, to take the hit, and uh, she gambled that the other side would need her more than she needs them. And I think that we should also look at that in this economy, in all economies, in fact, is we have consumer-based societies, and we have more power than we possibly Well, the imagine. problem with activists here, in this country particularly, is that they don't want to negotiate for a win. They want to try to convince the other side to be nice. Yes. Okay? Well, they, they think, we're compassionate. We want you to be compassionate. Now can you criticize us for being more compassionate? Because it's a losing strategy. That's why I can, you know, Taylor Swift doesn't care. She's not being compassionate. She's not trying to get Apple computer to st smoke a, you know, a huff bone and start, you know, singing kumbaya and join hands and be loving to each but other. Our economies are debt-based. They're highly leveraged. So one of the mocking, so pe a lot of activists are afraid of being mocked, and they mock you for being little and not mattering and stuff like that. The same they did to Greece. They said Greece is a pitiful little tiny country of people who don't work, and it's only 2% of the e European economy. And yet people are afraid of the Grexit. So, of course, they have a lot more power. If, if Greece has power over the might of Germany. Well, so does a, a simple activist out there protesting against Apple, well, it all whether it's Taylor Swift or a person in a square. It all begins with a basic understanding of economics, though, and numeracy. You can't be financially illiterate, let's say, like Charlotte Church, for example, go out there on stage, mumble some nonsense and platitudes about feeling good about myself, and expect that to have any impact whatsoever. You need to have some basic understanding of how the economy works, how corporations work, how government works, and, or else just don't get up on stage. Well, look at who Cameron and Osborne serve, and it's the bankers. And why did they serve the bankers? The bankers say, we are too big to fail. We are going to crush your economy if you dare step away from us. The people don't come back with their own retort similar to that. We're going to just stop working. We're just going to stop consuming. We're just going to stop participating. We're going to withhold our vote from all of you charlatans out there. And here, because we people participate, because Russell Brand said, you know, go vote, well, they have a mandate. And the mandate is working poor set to face cut and tax credits as David Cameron attacks merry-go-round welfare system. So tax credits for the working poor are set to fall victim to the government's pledge to wipe 12 billion pounds from the welfare budget as David Cameron insists Britain must stop the merry-go-round of handing benefits to those in work. The Prime Minister will attack the system introduced by Tony Blair's Labour government, whereby lower-paid workers pay their taxes but then receive the same amount and sometimes more back in welfare. So the merry-go-round is like all fun and games for you little people down there, all you poor working people, when the merry-go-round is actually the revolving door between the Chancellor's office and the City of London and the free subsidies, the 38 billion pounds a year they receive in subsidies from the too-big-to-fail subsidies. I mean, this is a fools and horses economy made up of Del Boy wannabes. There's no true activism in this country. They're just people who have not yet gotten on the property bubble ladder. 
and nobody really cares about anybody else. Uh, you know, they, the, the, the so-called cry for help for the disabled and the disadvantaged is a smokescreen for a bunch of greedy little Marmite-loving twerps who don't really care. And which bit of the welfare budget is sacrosanct, which they are not cutting? The one that they are not cutting is the pensioners, the old people that go out and vote, that, that uh, threaten to withhold their vote. If they, if they don't get what they want. Right. They're, 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 you can affect change if you want to be on the playing field and do battle. But you can't be sitting up there in the peanut gallery with a flower saying, we want our compassion, to, we want you to be compassionate like us. I mean, this is what the Iroquois and the Sioux attempted to do with the U.S. Army. They're now living on reservations, uh, starving to death. And Ian Duncan Smith adds into the mix of welfare cuts. He says, quote, reforming the damage and culture of welfare dependency and ensuring the work that work pays has been central to our mission to make Britain fit for the future. Welfare dependency. Well, who's dependent on welfare here? See, these people, these financially illiterate activists don't hammer home again and again and again and again that the hugest welfare budget here is goes towards the banks, towards the too big to fail banks that hold us hostage by having a, a big threat of uh, leaving the whole, of causing chaos and collapse. And I see a headline from la from two years ago, UK banks benefited from 38 billion pound too big to fail state subsidy. New Economics Foundation argues despite huge government subsidies, big banks are not supporting the real economy, and yet they continue to get the subsidy of the too big to fail subsidy, i.e. they get to borrow at a much lower rate than they would have normally if people think they could possibly collapse and their share prices also elevated compared to what they would if people thought the chancellor wouldn't step in and rescue them. I mean, the point you're making there is the biggest welfare recipients are the banks and the revolving door between banks and governments. And the activists don't really want to attack that because it would require spending at least two hours learning what a bank does, what the economy is made up of, and how mathematics works. But they don't want to do that because they'd rather just say, well, we love you and please love us. And by the way, uh, why did you put us in prison? And finally, a quick headline to, because the Tories have a mandate, because we did not withhold our vote. Well, Queen's income safe from cuts for two years despite rising revenues. The Queen's income has increased in recent years from 36.1 million pounds to more than 40 million pounds, according to the Telegraph. But the royal finances appear set to be untouched by the Conservatives' austerity plans. Hey, don't look at me. We uh, successfully... Uh, I got rid of the Queen back in the 1776 period. All right, well, we got to go. You'll never believe this, what? but the Redcoats are actually here. They're what? ready for a revolution. <laughs> My God, get George Washington on the phone. Let's go back in time. We're taking over. We're going to do it. Free Britain. Don't go away. Much more coming your way. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to New York and speak with Michael Bonanno of The Yes Men. And they're out with a new film, The Yes Men Are Revolting. Michael, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. It's always great to be on your show. Before we talk about the film, I wanted to just mention something because The Yes Men and Michael Bonanno in particular, you guys almost invented the idea of culture jamming, which is the idea that you take stuff that's in our culture that people see every day, but twisting it around so that it has a whole new meaning. And um, this has been a very effective uh, over the years. To, and, and so would you, is that still how you would describe what you do or, or is that, am I, am, I, am I wrong? Well, yeah, we could call it culture jamming, but we also just like to tell it creative activism or storytelling. I mean, what we do really is give journalists an excuse to cover news that they already want to cover, but don't necessarily have the, uh, you know, editorial uh, rubber stamp to do it. So let's talk about uh, the film, which is now, it's, it's coming out. The Yes Men Are Revolting. And it goes back and it reviews some of the highlights of uh, the Yes Men, what, what they've been up to. And can you just talk a little bit about the film now? Yeah, so uh, we have this new film called The Yes Men Are Revolting, and uh, it's, it's a very funny film about climate change. Um, it follows us as we try to intervene in business meetings. We interrupt, or, uh, interrupt organizations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, the largest business lobby in the world, uh, in order to announce, for example, that they're changing their position and getting behind climate legislation instead of blocking it, as they've done for so long in the U.S., and so it's a it's a funny movie, a fun movie about climate change. Well, I, you know the the statistics are 
are pretty shockingly I irrefutable. The, the planet's heating up. I mean, over a 10-year basis, a five-year basis, a three-year basis, and you see enormous storms. You see, you see climate chaos. You see everything that was predicted would happen is happening, and the world's falling apart climatologically. But yet, even the Pope, Michael, even the Pope has written in his encyclical that the Earth's become, and I, and I paraphrase here, a smoldering pile of according to the recent pope, uh, and I paraphrase, I believe he just used the word filth. Now, um, even the pope can't seem to convince 80 million American Catholics, though, who are uh, evangelical Catholics who'd say, now the pope is irrelevant, forget the pope, there's no such thing as climate change. How do you break through that? Well, uh, you do it by creating a movement, and, and we don't necessarily need those 80 million people to make a difference. Strangely enough, uh, historically, movements win because of a small vocal minority of people who have the moral high ground. So things like the civil rights movement, women's suffrage. I mean, women's suffrage did not have a majority of people supporting it, but women did get the vote eventually through enough pressure and agitation. And so what we really need to do is concentrate on mobilizing the people around us who it feel the way we do, like we want a future for the planet or the way that the Pope does. That's what we have to do is work on getting those people out in the streets and those people, you know, talking to their elected representatives and getting those people to put pressure on government to get the money out so that we can start to make decisions that are smart for the future. Let me, let me ask you about another film that's hitting theaters soon. It's called The Martian. And it's a big Hollywood blockbuster film. And, and a Hollywood actor is stranded on Mars, and, and he has to build a, a whole uh, kind of eco-village for himself and find his way back to Earth. And the message is that, you know, here you are in a, in a planet that's been destroyed by climate change, essentially, Mars. Uh, but we, all we need is good pluck and fortitude and a can-do attitude, and Hollywood will save the day. It'll, it'll be, we're going to save the day at the last second because we, we're American and, and we're, we're champions. And, you know, there's this attitude out there, Michael, that, you know, at the end of the day, if it really gets serious, we'll, we're just going to send in a, a major Hollywood star and save the day. Your thoughts on this? I love stories like that, stories of uh, salvation, redemption, you know, but... But in the end, uh, those stories usually involve a very, very small group of people surviving. And we'd like to see a large group of people survive, not just this, uh, you know, ingenious small few who have gifts and who have money. Uh, so, you know, our goals are to, you know, save the planet now up front instead of waiting till later till we have to go to Mars. And, you know, they did try to do this before. They tried to set up a kind of... Mars-like dome here in Arizona called Biosphere, <laughs> you know, where they were creating this sort of living environment that was separate from the rest of the desert environment in Arizona. And eventually they started sneaking out and stealing candy bars and things like that. So it, it doesn't actually work that well. It's not a great solution. It's kind of like setting up a, a little prison for yourself somewhere in space. So I'd like to keep this Earth. It'd be better. Well, it just uh, seems that uh, the incentive for people to take action in a way that's going to stop this premature human extinction, it's not enough for them to tell them that. In other words, how about this for an idea? Here's a billion dollar industry. Well, let me get your thoughts on this. It's called um, wrongful birth insurance. In other words, people who are giving birth to children today are doing so knowing that there's not enough life in the planet for them to live an entire human life. So they have the right to sue their parents for wrongful birth. What, what, isn't this a good idea? You guys can make a billion dollars selling wrongful birth I, insurance. Take that to the S-Men. Yes you know, I'm, I'm sorry that you, you mentioned it now on the air because we've already got a team starting the company, and I'm afraid you're going to be cut out of it. I'm, you know, you can't just talk about these things when they're such a good idea. Yeah, it's already um, been bought out by Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett already offered $12 billion for Wrongful Birth, Inc., and the Yes Men get nothing, I get nothing, Warren Buffett gets everything. So, but the, the activism world, I mean, there's revolution in the air. Russell Brand here in the UK has called for a revolution. People are talking about revolution. But when the push comes to shove, you know, the re they, it dies a horrible death because it means actually sacrificing something and God forbid that ever happens. So, I mean, people are willing to, 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 to have a revolution, but not if it's gonna, you know, cost them anything. 
Um, how do you get them to act, well, actually I'm, sacrifice? I'm, Go ahead. I mean, a lot of that is is uh, what that's about is in our our movie. Actually, the Yes Men Are Revolting is about how, in a way these revolutions or these movements take a very long time to succeed. And so, yes, we have many defeats along the way, but eventually these ideas do win. And, and I mean, in the case of climate change, I mean, there is a definitive kind of end game. Uh, the stakes are super high, and eventually we will hit the wall. It's just the, the, the question is when. And, you know, the sooner that we can have this, you know, revolution to change the system... Uh, that's allowing this sort of runaway climate change to happen, the better. I mean, the hope for us is that uh, there are a lot of people working on great, you know, great solutions to this. And the final scene in this movie is so much fun because it's about a solution. It's about creating renewable energy projects that are locally owned. And those things, you, when, you, when you start to kind of think about it, the incentives for owning our own energy are so extreme that we just need to break the stranglehold of the oil companies on government, and we should be able to do it. So we're feeling like getting enough people involved and putting enough pressure on and the stakes continually ratcheting up mean that we're getting closer to having that revolution. And I mean nonviolent revolution. I'm not talking about taking up arms and fighting. I'm talking about uh, collectively changing the system and doing it quickly enough to save the planet from catastrophe. Right. So the, one, one of the main themes of the film <clears throat> is... Um this idea, as, as you've brought up a couple of times here, that it, it does take time chipping away at it uh, day by day by day. You add that all up over time, and, and there have been instances, and there are examples throughout history. I mean, even the American Re Revolution, after the uh, Declaration of Independence in 1776, there wasn't really uh, the first president didn't take office for 10, 11, 12 years after that. So it took a lot of fighting and a lot of work just to, uh, to make good on that promise. So the film, is, is it going to be in general release? Are you looking for a distributor or is it going? Where, how is that being handled? Well, right now it's, it's, it's being released in North America. Um, it's coming out in, in Germany soon. It's coming out in uh, Scandinavia soon. Uh, there's a bunch of places where it is being released. There's some places where we don't have a deal yet. The responses from, from folks that have been to the film, they walk out of the theater, and it's a, uh, is it a hopeful feeling that they have? Uh, what, what's been the response? Well, you know, it's funny. People walk out, they, they feel a little bit melancholy, but also a little bit hopeful. But... Uh, most of them are ready to do something, and that's why we created this thing called the Action Switchboard, which is an, is an online platform for getting people together for direct action. It's a bit like if you mashed up Tinder, Kickstarter, and Skillshare, all for bringing people together for creative direct action. So, uh, it's yeah, it's our new thing that we're trying to... We're trying to actually convert people's attention from the movie and excitement about the movie into action by introducing them to each other so they can do these creative actions on their own. Right, and so on the technology front, I know in the area of climate change anyway, and uh, there is pretty remarkable advances being made in solar energy, energy and renewables, and uh, it almost set to have like a bit of a quantum leap in the amount and the effectiveness of those technologies. A and so potentially this could be an energy solution. And do you guys, uh, do you ever behind this, I mean, do you ever kind of support those specific technological platforms uh, in, in any case? Or are you just focusing on getting this message out that we need to be awake about the dangers of this climate change? No, we, we definitely are big supporters of uh, solar and wind energy. But the other half of that equation is that we don't just need green energy. We need green energy that's tied to social justice. So in the last action of their film, we, have, we pose as uh, representatives of the Department of Energy from the United States. And we go to a Homeland Security conference. And we announced that the U.S. is going to convert to renewables by 2030 entirely, outlawing f burning fossil fuels for power and for, you know, in automobiles. And, you know, you might be surprised to see that actually everybody in the audience, all the defense contractors, generals, admirals, get up and actually dance in celebration of the renewable energy project. But the special thing about it is that it's owned by Native Americans. It's not just a renewable energy project. It's also owned by a real community that has been deprived of its resources over many, many years. So we can look at this 
energy transition as an opportunity to address social justice at the same time as environmental justice. Yeah, I, I saw the uh, the film, and I've seen all of your films, and I think this is the first time when you've done one of these events at a corporate event like this, where the audience actually kind of like joined in with what you were doing, uh, and they seemed to be a core group within the audience that was willing to defect and join up with the good guys. Maybe that's a trend that is starting to come around. Even inside the worst of the worst, there seems to be a growing awareness. Anyway, we got to go. Mike Bonanno, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Mike Bonanno of the Yes Men. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.